Uh, so it's two two now. I think we can get started. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome um, and welcome to our ASIC seminar um, series. Um, and this is John. Um, I will be moderating uh, this seminar uh, together with our communication uh, specialist, Kelly. Uh, Kelly is um, will be in charge of the Q and A session. Um, and just so you know that uh, the seminar is being recorded uh, and we will publish the video recording later on, on our YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to check it out later. Uh, usually it takes about one week or so. Um, and uh, so after the speaker's presentation, uh, we will have the Q&A session. So please feel free to um, ask um, a verbal question or you can uh, chat us a question and we will uh, read it out. Uh, so today, um, we are very excited to have um, Dr. Um, Isaac Moradi with us. Um, Isaac um, is with us. Um, and before he gets started, let me um, give a brief introduction about the um, Isaac. So um, Dr. Isaac Moradi is a research scientist um, at the University of Maryland, uh, affiliated with NASA Global Modeling and Assimilation Office. Uh, he has over 15 years uh, experience uh, specializing in predictive transfer modeling, um, observing system simulation experiments, data assimilation, uh, satellite data analysis, and bios correction, and developing microwave instruments. He's currently the PI of multiple projects targeting uh, enhancing the assimilation of microwave and radar measurements into the NWP models, especially by uh, improving the forward predictive transfer models for such observations. He's also a uh, the co i uh, of two projects funded by NOAA and NASA to develop the next generation of hyperspectral microwave instruments. And Dr. Moradi um, has a PhD in climate um, and environment planning from the University of um, Tehran and a second PhD in radio and space science uh, from Chambers University of Technology in Sweden. Prior to joining uh, University of Maryland, he worked at uh, Lully University of Technology uh, and also University of Tehran. Uh, so let's welcome the speaker and um, Let's hear about the uh, recent development in the assimilation of microwave and radar observation into uh, NWP. Uh, so, I say, please go ahead. Right, thank you, John. There are uh, seven people in the room. <laughs> I miss those old days that we used to have 80, 90 people <laughs> for each seminar. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm from University of Maryland, of course. I've been working here for 12 years, I believe so. Uh, let me thank uh, Ben Johnson and Patrick Stigman. They are uh, from JCSCA. They basically are uh, the CRTM. Uh, ben is project scientist, uh, project lead. And Alan here from ECMW, he helped us with running the ECMW IFS system to generate some basically some high resolution model runs for the validation. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, Patrick, Ron, Satya, and Will McCarty, they have work in different aspects of this project, providing guidance. So this uh, project, the first part was funded by JPSS and the second part is funded by the NASA map for the simulation of radar observations. So I'll start with an introduction, then uh, basically introduce the scattering database that we have in, uh, implemented into CRTM. Uh, I'll show some validations on the differences between basically the new scattering lookup tables and the old ones. Uh, and we'll talk about the uh, radar simulator that we have implemented into CRTM and some results from the school slides from the hyperspectral micro instrument that we are basically developing. So here's the, uh, basically the micro spectrum going from almost 10 gigahertz to we have up to 200 gigahertz. There are new instruments working even at 600 gigahertz. 
this is the spectrum for the frequency range that we have focused on because of the ATMS and other instruments basically working in this range. So there are some, uh, so basically the x-axis is frequency, the y-axis is the optical depth. So the blue one is for water vapor. Uh, it's hard to turn back now. Yeah. So we have this 183 gigahertz, that is basically the water vapor channels. And then we have the 60 gigahertz there for temperature sounding channels. So if you look at the, so some of the channels, for example, on board ATMS, these channels don't really see the clouds. So the focus of these developments have been really to improve the all the sky uh, radiative transfer simulations. Some of the ATMS channels aren't really sensitive to clouds because they peak very high in the atmosphere, like anything above 10 kilometers doesn't really see much clouds. And then we have the other channels that are sensitive to clouds. Some of them, anything 90 gigahertz and below is basically 90 gigahertz and below is sensitive to liquid and rain cloud or hydrometeors, not really clouds. And anything above 90 gigahertz is mostly sensitive to frozen hydrometeors, such as snow, hail, and gravel. So, so this is basically the observation impact from uh, different uh, observations. Uh, this is from the NASA GEOS model. On the x-axis, we have the fractional impact. Uh, the y-axis are different instruments. Uh, you see that the microwave instruments like AMSU and ATMS, they have the highest impact on basically the NWP forecast. So if we look at the ATMS, basically the impact from different ATMS channels, you see channels 10, uh, 5 to 10, they have the highest impact in terms of uh, the impact on the NWP forecast. And those are the channels, mostly temperature sounding channels. So the channels that are sensitive to clouds and surface like uh, 1 to 5, as well as uh, especially those channels 16 and up, those channels, they are really important, but they don't have much impact. Now, even, you know, they are doing all the sky data assimilation because of the inaccuracy in the basically forward models that we use to assimilate satellite radiances into uh, NWP models. So this is basically the data assimilation. It has two terms. This is the uh, cost function. So the left term is for the background. The right term is for the observation. Basically, we try. So there is a background provided by the forecast model, such as temperature, humidity, profiles, ozone, et cetera. And then we have the Y vector, which is observation, let's say from different ATMS channels. Then we use this H of X, H is in this case, our radiative transfer model that we use to uh, convert those profiles into simulated observations. And then we just look at the uh, O minus F or the uh, observed minus simulated values. That's the way basically we minimize those differences. So that's where the, the forward model or the radiative transfer model comes in data assimilation. So in clear sky, this H only depends on really the absorption and emission uh, plus the visibility from the surface, of course. So it's, it's, it's not very simple, but it's ways uh, when it compare clear sky and cloudy sky, dealing with cloudy skies is a lot more complicated because in cloudy sky, in addition to those uh, absorption and emission, it also depends on a set of scattering parameters, uh, such as the scattering coefficients, the phase function, and so on. And those parameters, they depend on the shape of the hydrometers. So, this is the way CRTM works. So CRTM is the community radiative transfer model. It was developed by NOAA, um, mostly STAR and JCSCA. It's, it's been used by NOAA, NASA, and many other centers for doing data assimilation, as well as for general remote sensing purposes, such as retrieval, like for example, in the MIR system. So it has, uh, there are a few modules in CRTM. The forward module is the one that simulate the radiances. And then we have, uh, tangent linear, adjoint, and Jacobian, those are used in the data assimilation pro process. So it has this set of in inter internal modules that are basically called by when you run, for example, the forward model. One of them is the one that uh, calculates the cloud scatter uh, for all the sky based on the cloud water content values provided uh, as input. So the current CRTM lookup tables for hydrometeors 
they have been generated using the mu theory, so it assumes everything is spherical. But in real world, we have really particles with different shapes. So this uh, so-called discrete dipole approximation. So instead of assuming one single shape, it really uh, convert that uh, single shape into very uh, small dipoles. And basically you calculate the scattering properties for those dipoles and look at the basically in a dipole uh, 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 basically interaction. And then because you are using this small dipoles, you can generate whatever shape you have. And then you can come up with a set of shapes that are not necessarily spherical. Like for example, the database that we have put into CRTM. So this one has 18 different shapes. The original one has 39 shapes. So we have chosen 18 of them. You can see you can, using this TDA, you can generate many different shapes that are more realistic and you would expect to see in a real class. So on the left side, we have the single crystals and on the right side, we have the, the aggregates. So these are uh, mostly for frozen hydrometers. For, for liquid, you still have only uh, spherical particles, but they have actually a new database that has a realistic shape for the raindrops, for example. So it's not a, a sphere anymore. So when it comes to these particles, there are a few features that really change based on frequency and the shape of the particles. So the phase function tells us when, uh, when radiation or a signal hits a particle in which direction it will be a scattered. So if the zero is will be scattered in the forward direction and 180 it will be a scattered in the backward direction. And you see how it changes. So we have different shapes like gem, snow sector, snowflake, gem hill, and so on. And you see how the phase function or the scattering direction changes with the shape as well as frequency. So the colors uh, basically indicate different frequencies, 14, 36, and 94 gigahertz. Those are the frequencies used in uh, uh, cloud CPR and GPM DPR. And you see when we move to lower frequencies like 14 gigahertz, everything goes towards uh, really phase function. So we have pretty much the same in forward and backward uh, uh, direction. But when you go to higher frequencies like 94 gigahertz, you see the forward scattering is dominant. And also there is a, a, a large difference between the shapes that we use uh, to calculate the scattering properties. There are other features that we are interested in. Uh, for example, in this one, we have the extinction and uh, absorption efficiencies. So these are the efficiencies are calculated by dividing the cross section by the area of each uh, each hydrometer or particle. And then we have the X, which is the size parameter is the diamond, is the diameter of the particle divided by wavelength. So both of them are unitless. So X axis is basically the uh, size parameter, the Y axis is the efficiency. Uh, then we have for extinction and absorption, for different particles like sector, snowflake, gem, snow, and so on. So top is 94 gigahertz, the bottom one is 14 gigahertz. And you just compare the top and the bottom plus, you see how the, those uh, scattering properties change from one frequency to another one, and also the differences between different shapes. Uh, the, the properties uh, highly depend on the shape of the hydrometeors as well as the frequency. Uh, one interesting thing is that if you look at the liquid uh, liquid sphere, the, the green line, you see there is a extinction. Extinction is absorption plus the scattering. So for the liquid sphere, extinction and absorption uh, are, are very close. It means there is little uh, scattering from the liquid uh, hydrometers. So, so what we see here, it was for one single particle, but what we have really in a volume of air, we can have many different particles with different sizes. So uh, we basically want this scattering properties for a volume of the air, not for a single particle. And we call them bulk scattering properties. In order to calculate the bulk scattering properties, we need to estimate how many of the number of different sizes that we can have in the volume of the air. And we use this uh, basically uh, particle size distribution to calculate this so-called number density. So it tells us the particle size distribution, you know, you say for this diameter, it tells you how many numbers you should expect 
in that volume of air. Of course, it changes, let's say, with the water content or effective radius. So that's what particle size distribution does. It, it we use a, uh, some version of this modified gamma distribution to basically calculate the, the number density. And once we have the number density or uh, N of D, then we can calculate the mass scattering coefficients for CRPM the way you see here. We use the cross sections, the number density, and we divide it by the by the mass to get the mass scattering properties for CR. So this is an example of the scattering properties that goes into CRTM. So on the top left, we have the extinction coefficient, and again for different frequencies, different shapes, and you see how it really changes the so the mass scattering, the variation in mass scattering properties because it's, it has been average is less than the single scattering properties, but again, it changes as a function of frequency uh, as well as it depends on, on the shapes. So we took this new uh, discrete dipole approximation database and converted into a lookup tables that can be used by CRTM. So in the old uh, CRTM lookup tables that was the, the lookup tables that were generated using the ME theory, so basically, we have 31 frequencies, 10 different sizes, uh, five temperatures in the new ones, and we only have uh, three shapes. That's uh, it's uh, liquid, snow, and ice. So, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's uh, liquid is so it's a uh, snow, ice, and hail. We only have three shapes in the in the old lookup tables plus, of course, liquid. In the new one, we have. Uh, 18 different shapes, uh, we have 200 frequencies, so it's much higher resolution. And, and we have, uh, so in the old one, we only have them for basically 10 different sizes. In the new one, we have 200 sizes. So it's a much higher resolution and it goes from uh, 100 to 200 gigahertz. So basically the goal was, uh, because CRTM is used basically by different centers. We didn't really want to break the system for anyone. So the way that we have implemented the new database into CRTM is that you don't really have to change anything in the interface. So it's uh, like if you are using the old system, the new CRTM would still work with your old system. For example, in data assimilation, they have an interface for within GSI to call CRTM. So we didn't want to break the system. If you do, then they are just gonna basically pushback. They are not going to let it really go into the repository. So that's a, uh, that was an important factor. So the way it works is just you run your old CRTM uh, the way that you used to do the, the old version, and it works. So those uh, in the old version, we have water cloud, rain cloud, the snow cloud, gravel cloud, ice cloud, and hail cloud. So those are still existing in the new one, but they are actually pointing to some uh, habit, for example, Snow cloud is uh, pointing to sector snowflake. Uh, but then when you run uh, all the sky CRTM, you have many different types like plate type one, column type one, the uh, uh, six polar rosa, four polar rosa, and so on that you can use uh, run uh, CRT. And also the old version is using the effective radius. When you run CRTM in the new one, you don't have to have effective radius anymore. It would run based on the cloud water content because Effective radius is uh, uh, sort of, you really have to estimate it because the model doesn't really provide it. So you have to use a relation to estimate the effective radius and we just wanted to move away from that. So here's an example of the simulations that we have done using CRTM. So the x-axis is frequency from 10 to 250 gigahertz. Uh, the y-axis on the top is brightness temperature. So the red one is the, uh, sorry, the, the blue one is clear sky, and then the red one is all sky, and the other ones are done using one single cloud type. Like when you run CRTM, let's say with rain only, or snow only, or hail only. Uh, and all the sky is, all the clouds that the model has provided to you is real, real all the sky, it has all the clouds included. And you see from the DTV how the different clouds can actually impact the brightness temperature. So below 90 gigahertz rain and liquid, they have emission impact. So it means the whole sky brightness temperatures are higher than clear sky brightness temperature. 
Um, when you go 90 gigahertz and above those frozen hydrometers, they have a scattering impact. So it means your all the sky brightness temperatures are going to be lower than uh, clear sky brightness temperatures. And you see the cloud impact can go uh, up uh, from 90 to 250 gigahertz. So that great one is from the old lookup tables. So it has this issue that really above 110 gigahertz, it doesn't really change much the scattering with the, with the frequency. So, and then it uh, basically, uh, you know, after we developed the, the lookup tables, the second step was really to see if they, they improve anything in the CRTM simulations. So basically in data simulation framework, you can run the system in two different ways. One is that you run really the, the, the forecast model, then it provides the uh, background to you and then you run it through CRTM. Or there is a, something we call the standalone. So it means you don't really run your forecast model. Instead, you take the analysis from a different experiment and run it through CRTM. So it means you basically take the forecast model out just in terms of computation time, it saves a lot. So that's basically the way we have done it. Uh, but instead, uh, we have used the IFS system. So it's basically, Alan ran the IFS system at very high resolution. And every seven minutes, he basically collocated the model forecast with the ATMS observations. And that's what the way we have done it so on the top. And then we ran CRTMs through the analysis that was provided by the, uh, by the IFS system. So this is for Hurricane Irma, uh, yeah, September 7, 2017. It's 18 UTC, so ATMS had this really nice overpass over Irma. So on top, we have the observations from ATMS, different channels, channel one, two, three. Those are mostly the channels that are really sensitive to clouds. And for some of them, like channel seven, isn't my sensitive. And you go higher, channel eight, nine, 10, they are not that sensitive to clouds anymore. Uh, so top row is the observation. Then second to the last one, those are the simulations done using different shapes, using the new lookup table. And the last one is done using the old lookup table. So let's first compare the old simulations with observations. You see above for the channel 16 and above, uh, especially above 90 gigahertz, uh, the old lookup tables, they don't generate enough scattering uh, compared to the observations. And anything below 90 gigahertz, there is too much scattering that comes really from the snow cloud. Like if you put a snow cloud into the outlook table, they generate too much scattering for 90 gigahertz and below. Uh, but if you compare the simulations done using the new lookup tables, different shapes, let's just look at the, for example, large uh, plate aggregate. So if we had the hail, uh, grapple, uh, liquid rain, uh, ice plus for the snow, we use this uh, large plate aggregate to basically describe it. Uh, you see there is a, uh, a much better consistency between the observations and the simulations, especially for some of those channels like channel four, five, six, seven, and eight, they are very, very close to the, to the observations uh, if you compare the second row to the first one. And even for the other channel, for like the high frequency channels near 180 gigahertz, as well as for the channels sensitive to rain, we still see a much better consistency between the new lookup tables, the simulations done using the new lookup tables and the old ones. Uh, there are source, uh, different sources that contribute to the differences. One is that really the no model can really give you the exact uh, cloud profiles that you need. So there is the highest source of error is really in the, in the forecast model. And of course you have the error in the lookup tables in the scattering calculations that, it, that is done within CRT. So uh, these are the scatter plots uh, for the same uh, uh, SK event. Uh, these are different channels, one, two, three, et cetera. So the red one is done, the new simulations using the new lookup tables. The blue ones are the simulations done uh, using the old uh, CRTM lookup tables. And we have much, much better consistency between the simulations and observations for the new lookup tables. The biases that you see in the cloud sensitive uh, channels, they are really mostly gone. And uh, uh, we see it really through all the channels one to 22. Uh, so we are, I have up to channel 16, uh, but especially for those channels like channel 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those are the channels that see a large improvement because the old lookup table generate too much of scattering for clouds. So then uh, when you compare the old uh, data simulation system, they use the O minus F, the observed minus forecasted values for comparison. But when it comes to cloud, the problem is that the forecast model doesn't really give you the clouds at the right time, at the right place. So you have to look at the basically the frequency for the brightness temperatures rather than the O minus F differences. And so we use this, uh, uh, we call it the SOGAM difference index. So this was something that was introduced by Alan here. Uh, basically, we look at the histograms instead of the uh, directly looking at the O minus F differences. The smaller, the better, basically the number. So uh, channel, this row one to the last one, these are done using different shapes from the DDA lookup table. The last one is done using the CRTM all lookup tables. These are different channels columns. The last column shows the sum for all the channels. You see the differences is 714 for all lookup tables. For the new lookup tables, we are really in the order of 600, 500 to 600. Some of them, such as uh, Slicker Snowflake, for example, large plate aggregate, they perform better than the, the other shapes. Uh, so the reason that basically uh, I mentioned about this particle size distribution, we use the field 2007 as the, basically for the particle size distribution for frozen hydrometeors. And the reason was that basically these particle size distribution, they need water content as input to the model, uh, as input to the particle size distribution to uh, calculate the moments. And so once you have the number density, you can also calculate uh, so you have a water content that goes into PSD as input. So once you calculate the number density, you can calculate the, basically the water content or the estimated water content as mass times number density. So these two should be really very close. Otherwise, the particle size distribution is not really conserving the mass. And that was the reason that we basically look at like five different, uh, five, six different particle size distributions and we chose uh, field 2007 based on the, basically this condition. For most of them, the, this, uh, for most of them, this was uh, basically in the order of 0.1, the log of the ratio of the input water content to the prescribed water content was very close to 0.1. So it means they are really very close. Uh, for some shapes, it could be like 0.2 or so. And then we look at other particle size distribution because what you really want to do is the particle size distribution that has been used by the forecast model. So I was working with the imaging, uh, imaging time from GFDL to basically run this through the shield data assimilation system. And they have this GFDL particle size distribution. So it has two different versions. Uh, one of them we call the old, uh, it's just really based on the date. I have the references if you are interested. And then I did the same validation. So I generated the lookup tables uh, using those uh, particle size distributions and then compared with the observations. And you see those uh, basically particle size distribution, they give you actually very large differences when compared to build uh, 2007. Of course, if you change your input, you may end up with different results, but at least with this accurate, pretty accurate, IFS profiles, the field 2007 performed way better than the others. So these are the simulations that were done using field 2007. And these are the ones that were done using GFDL. Uh, so you see really the differences between the two. If you look at those channels, especially, you see how particle size distribution can impact the results. So now I'm working with uh, basically Ben and Greg to generate the particle size distribution for uh, uh, Thompson 2008 that they are using into in the new FP3 model. That's a bit more complicated because the number density is actually forecasted by the model. So that would need extra changes into CRT. Okay, so I want to switch to the second part, uh, the radar simulator. So for the same reason that I showed, basically if you want to assimilate radar observations into a forecast model, you need to have a forward model that simulates the observations from the input profile. So for the radars, basically we have worked with the space-borne radars, but it's the same for ground-based. The signal is transmitted by the radar. It 
basically travels through the atmosphere, it hits a raindrop or a hydrometeor, it could be a snow or rain or whatever, then it's uh, basically reflected back to the same antenna. So you need to know the scattering properties of that hydrometeor as well as uh, uh, basically the optical depths of the atmosphere between the antenna and the target uh, hydrometeor. So the radar equation can be simplified into this form that, so it depends on the wavelength, uh, wavelength lambda dielectric factor and so on, but the most important parameter for calculating the radar reflectivity is really the backscattering coefficient. Uh, and that depends on the backscattering cross section as well as the number density that comes from the particle size distribution. Um, and again, if you look at the, basically the backscattering properties for different particles, so these are uh, different shapes, uh, sector of snowflake, gem of snow, gem hail, and, and so on. And again, the x-axis is size parameter, the y-axis is basically the efficiency. So we have the uh, extension and absorption. And on the right, we have the forward scattering and backward scattering efficiencies. And you see how they change with the basically, we have two different frequencies. You see the back scattering is largely changes with the frequency as well as the shape of the, of the hydrometeors. So these are, uh, this is an example of the basically the simulations. So this is already into CRTM. It has been, it's actually into, it will be released in CRTM version three, but it's already in the repository and uh, anyone with access to the CRTM GitHub, they should be able to get uh, basically the new version with the simulator as well as with the, uh, uh, with the look update. So this one is using the, so one problem was that uh, all lookup tables, they don't really have the backscattering information, which was required basically to uh, calculate the radar reflectivity. So we are using, so we have added the backscattering properties to the new lookup table. So you have to run it using the new lookup table. So on the top left, uh, so there are two panels. The top one, those are the uh, CloudSat CPR uh, measurements, the reflectivities. This is for hurricane bill. So that's the, so the, this bottom one, it shows the cloud water content from MODIS. And then the, the, the line shows the cloud side overpass over the, over the hurricane. And it really passed through the eye of the, the hurricane. That doesn't happen that often, uh, but this was a very good chance to see uh, right through the eye of the, of the cyclone. So on that one, are, those are the measurements from the cloud set. And the bottom ones are the simulations that we have done using the basically radar simulator. Uh, so the trick here is really the, the input profiles are the most important element in uh, simulating the radar reflectivities. You can use like the forecast models, but they would really never get that close to the, uh, to the measurements. So we have used a set of retrievals that were from like uh, different eight train instruments and combine them to get the rain, the snow and the other water content values to use as input for the simulation. So the top is basically measurements, the bottom one are simulations. They are very close. There are some differences of course. So we have, so on the left side, uh, the ice water content was prescribed using ice sphere. Uh, on the right side, they are prescribed using ice cloud. So when, you use ice cloud in CRTM, it doesn't really look at the uh, scattering. It only takes the smallest spin in the lookup tables. So it doesn't really give you that much back scattering because it's basically skipping the water content. It just looks at the, the smallest spin of the lookup tables. And so you see the differences between that plot and this plot, that's the impact that you would really get from using the ice cloud in doing the uh, radar reflectivity calculations. If you go to lower frequencies like DPR, it's, it's going to be different because for DPR, it's mostly sensitive to basically rain. So it's a, it's a different story. So this is for hurricane build. Uh, this is for Typhoon Nida. Um, so this one uh, was also the same year, 2009, 11.30. Uh, this one also passed right through the eye, but at that point, the cyclone was weakening, so the eye is really filled. 
with the cloud. So again, on the top, we have the, uh, we have the measurement. You don't see the eye clearly because it's really filled with clouds. Uh, and then the bottom one are the simulations. Uh, if I just go back one second. So you see the 273 line, that's the temperature line. So below that 273, it's a, it's a so-called melting zone. So what happens when the frozen particles are really falling toward the 273, they aggregate. So they basically generate this large uh, uh, aggregates that increases the reflectivity. When they are passing through that melting layer, they start melting from the outside. They form uh, something from the eyes of the radar. It's, it looks like very huge raindrops. So you see this reflectivity is uh, basically that so-called bright band. You see this high reflectivities in the measurements, but we don't have that melting layer. So we don't really see them in the simulation. So that's something that is missing in our simulation. Uh, but that can be fixed by basically implementing a melting uh, layer model into the simulator. So we see the same here that this is the melting layer when they pass through that uh, melting zone, they start melting, forming this uh, something that looks like uh, raindrops. But when they pass through that, they basically completely melt, they form a smaller particles and they basically drop faster. So the density decreases and then you see that the reflectivity goes down after after that layer. So, uh, so the radars, they measure basically really attenuated reflectivity because it's passing through the atmosphere twice. So that attenuation itself basically, so what we had, that was the attenuated reflectivity. So that's the impact from the atmosphere, not from the, it could be from the, let's say hydrometeors as well as gases like water vapor. So the, for, in this case, this is really a hurricane. So the attenuation can be something up to 10 dBZ in this case, but it's normally very small if you don't really have this much of like rain and liquid clouds, the attenuation is normally smaller. So then we, so that was one single case. We look at like a number of cases. And these are basically the density plus the x-axis is the reflectivity, the y-axis is temperature. So did below 273 Kelvin, uh, we have this melting layer issue, but aside from that, there's a, there's a pretty good consistency between the measurements and simulation. On the left, we have observed, on the right, we have simulated, so these are, on the left, we have for global data. On the right, we have for tropical cyclones. And one is on the top was uh, for hurricane field, the other one is for typhoon data. So those are basically for all of them below this 270 Kelvin, we really, because of the melting layer, we, are, we don't have that consistency with the, with the measurements. So then we look at uh, basically, so this radar simulator, you know, we are basically testing it within the uh, JEDI system. And you can also use it for other purposes. Like for example, if you want to design a new radar, new instrument, you can really use it to see, like for example, in this case, we have used it to see the, uh, basically the impact of different hydrometeors like a snow, ice, hail and so on on the, on the radar reflectivities. So for example, you have the ice water content here in uh, gram per kilogram, and then you see the impact on the reflectivities from ice water content only, or uh, we have the snow water content here, and the impact that it can have on, on reflectivities. For example, rain, for this uh, 94 gigahertz rain doesn't really have that much impact. You see it can generate up to maybe five dBC or so, but the impact from uh, ice uh, so is, is a lot higher. And then uh, I showed that other than the forward model, you need to add the tangent linear adjoint and Jacobians or K matrix into CR team. So we have developed, uh, if you're interested, I can show, uh, you know, we have the paper under review that how we basically, you come up with the, uh, this matrices for uh, for the adjoint top by uh, tangent linear and the bottom one are, are the adjoint. Uh, we are also working on this uh, so-called hyperspectral microwave instrument. So we have two projects funded by NOAA and NASA basically to develop, like the ATMS has 22 channels and that's the max we have. With this new technology, you can't get really a thousand channels, depends on how many units you can actually uh, assemble into one, one instrument. 
So instead of 22 channels, you have really thousand channels that you can use to see the impact of clouds or improve the, the water vapor retrievals and so on. So here's an example uh, how it can really impact. These are done using synthetic observations. So uh, this is one single profile. So we have the temperature on this SQC plots. We have temperature and the dew point. So the green is the, basically the background. Then ATMS is the blue one. And the, the red one is uh, the HIMPI retrievers and the black one are the truths. Uh, uh, because we are doing synthetic observations, we have the truths here. So if you compare ATMS and HIMPI uh, weighting function, you see how HIMPI basically improves the, this uh, 700 to 500, for example, in terms of the, uh, in terms of basically scanning the atmosphere uh, because you can have many more channels, so you, you have better coverage and as well as better vertical resolution. Uh, so the, so Antonia, she's Antonia number four, she's the instrument PI. Uh, we have a paper in the IGAR 2022. This plot is not really from that paper. Uh, but if you are interested, it has more details. When it comes to instrument, you can't really present that much uh, you know, until the instrument has been uh, built and uh, so uh, So you see how basically those channels, they can really improve the, the water, uh, let's say water vapor retrieval, or in this case, it's really in temperature unit. So compare the blue one, which is from ATMS to the red one, with the black one, that is the truth. You see how they can really improve the, the water vapor information uh, uh, if you have more channels, let's say 183 gigahertz. And of course the temperature sounding channels are also going to help to improve the both temperature retrievals or when you uh, assimilate them into a forecast model. Yeah, that's all. I don't need probably to read the conclusion. The, basically this new lookup tables, the new simulator, they are into CRTM. If you want to try them, they should be released within version three to the public, or if you have access to the CRTM repository, you can basically try them. Uh, uh, so basically this radar simulator, it can really work for any instrument as long as you have the basically CRTM with two set of coefficients with uh, power or the absorption coefficients and the instrument specific coefficients. So you can really run it for any uh, frequency that you want as long as you have uh, basically those uh, two set of uh, coefficients. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, very nice talk, a lot of information. So I'm particularly interested in the hopper spectral microwave topic. And you mentioned that this is a photonic methodology. How does that compare to the digital backend or, or software defined radio approach? Uh, is it different of frequency you are looking at or what, what is it? So it has basically the front end is just like a, uh, like the heterodyne receivers. You know, you have the antenna, you basically, uh, uh, but the, the back end is like you convert the micro microwave frequency uh, basically to optical frequencies, uh, really very uh, short wavelengths. And then you really process it using uh, probably commercially available uh, the digitizing and processing the, the back end. So the difference is really the back end that doesn't work. Like with the ATMS, you basically have this local oscillator that you mix the incoming frequency with the uh, local frequency to down convert it, let's say from 180 gigahertz to something. But this one doesn't work that way. You really convert it to more uh, like op op optical frequencies.
Yeah, it, it does really, you know. Uh, so Antonia had a talk in AMS, and she has many more plots in that AMS talk. And if you happen to be at iGARS in Pasadena, probably you see a lot more improvements and more examples. So I just wanted really to introduce it here rather than uh, but in the iGARS in July, uh, if, you are, if you happen to be at iGARS, you, you will see a lot, many more examples of the instrument. Uh, I don't know how much information they are really going to present from the instrument itself, but uh, from the results and how it can improve. So it wouldn't be just one single layer of the troposphere. It's really going to be through up to the stratosphere because you have many more, many more channels. I don't know about the orbit part of it. I know there will be airborne measurements in 2024. Yeah. There are two. Oh, yeah. My okay. Oh, here we go. We can just read. So Will Miller asks, do you think that the CRTM outlook output could even better out could even better match the observations if lookup tables also included meteorological inputs such as convection versus stratiform precipitation or tropical versus mid-latitude environment? So in so in the simulation that I show, so we actually did that work twice. Once using the error of five, and then because error of five doesn't of the convective precipitation. So we basically did it twice using the IFS. So in the simulation that I showed, it has the convective snow, which would be gravel and, almost, and also the convective precipitation. If you miss them, it really depends on the convection and how much it would impact the simulation. But that's really the way you need to have all the, like the water content values, whether from a larger scale or convection to be able to get close to the observation. And that's a problem that, you know, many of the data simulation systems, they really run it like with ice cloud and liquid cloud and everything else is missing in the system. So that's uh, basically uh, uh, probably one of the things that they need to take into account. That was the only question. You can email me uh, if you have questions, Bill, if you have any, Easy questions. Yeah, so thank, thank you, Isaac. This was really informative and, and sounds great. Um, can you tell us uh, how this new version of CRTM compares to other radiative transfer models that are available there? And another question would be, you showed us that for active microwave, for radar, like CRTM currently does not uh, simulate right back. On the passive microwave side, what would you recommend not to do with CRTM, what CRTM is not good for, um, just as an advice for, for users. So the second question, I'm not gonna lose my job, so I'm not gonna answer it. <laughs> CRTM, so to compare to, so we have a paper actually comparing CRTM with uh, uh, with ArtTop and Arts, and in clear sky, CRTM fairly does better than the other models. Like uh, even for surface sensitive channels, it's, it was way better than our It was published like uh, two years ago, it's in JGR. Uh, so in clear sky, it does better than the other models, or it's hard to say that really, but it's, it's comparable at least with the other models. In all sky, it's really hard to say because comparing the models in uh, all sky is, is not an easier, it's not as easy as like looking at the clear sky cases. I can tell CRTM has a better scattering solver compared to RTTOL. RTTOL has this delta dependent term and uh, the scattering solver in CRTM ABA is, is much better than that for sure. And I know they are 
seem to want to be implemented something similar to Artitop. In all the sky, we don't really know all the time. In, in clear sky for temperature sounding channels, uh, it's, it's really accurate. Like for temperature sounding channels, for the water vapor channels, probably you have an error in the order of 0.5 to 0.1 Kelvin, which could be just because of the input profiles uh, or the problems in the scattering, uh, sorry, in the, uh, let's see, the water vapor continuum that we use in CRTM or in the other models. Uh, so that's, I, I can't tell you. I mean, if you look at the paper we have for all the channels. For the clear, for the cloudy sky, it's really hard to say the error because you really need to have very good input profiles to compare with the observations to know whether the problem is from CRTM. You shouldn't really, uh, uh, you know, the error that you have in the in input profiles doesn't really have to do with the RT model. That's uh, and so we can't really distinguish between the error in the input profiles and the error in our radiative transfer calculations to tell you how accurate the model is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first, my apologies for not being here for the intro. Um, I had a federal agent show up at my door unexpected doing a background check. And well, I, I just could not get out of there. I wasn't sure if I was going to be arrested and taken away the way they question you. But in, in any case, so my apologies on that. But I had a question. So uh, you met SAT's got their, their next generation of instruments, and they're going to have the MWI, which I think has 118 gigahertz. And then they have the, the ICI, which goes up to like three or 400 gigahertz, I believe. So how well would your model, or can your model take on those additional frequencies? Short answer, no. <laughs> really for the ice cloudy measure, we only go up to 200 gigahertz in the lookup tables. So for ICI, you have to generate the lookup tables up to, I think they have 600 gigahertz close by 500 something. Uh, so actually it worked on the department that developed the ice cloud imager 10 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, so with the, and, and that's the C basically something that we need to do. So the database that we have used, it has the, basically the scattering properties for up to 600 gigahertz. So we can actually generate a new lookup table, but it's not going to be for all the habits. Some of them, they go up to 200 gigahertz, some of them go up to, so it, we will have a new set of lookup tables that has the scattering properties for up to 600 gigahertz, but for only some of the shapes that I showed here, not for, for everything. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I think that's important for the new instruments. I hope the background check wasn't for me. So I was a uh, very interesting talk and I was interested in your lookup tables and how you sort through that. And I was just wondering and wondering out loud now, um, in terms of trying to match in real time, so as you're using this for, um, let's say operational models or across the street, is there a role here uh, in helping getting at least the right selection with machine learning or AI? Is there any work being done within this part of the process within this part of the data selection process that eventually gets into the data assimilation, um, whether it's through the CRTM or even before it gets there. I'm just curious, is, do you see a role for that? So for, so for the AI, if you really want to, this has been discussed um, you know, within the CRTM team and how you can use AI. So there are part of the models that can be replaced 
Like for example, the way we do the lookup tables, instead of doing all the regression, especially for the absorption lookup tables, you can't really replace it with AI. And also the scattering solver, there are a few, of course, at NASA, at least I'm aware of, that they are trying to use basically AI, instead of the scattering solver, use the AI to do the scattering calculation, which is a lot uh, faster. So when you compare clear sky and all the sky, clear sky calculations are a lot faster. But if you use AI, it's not just more accurate, it's also a lot faster. I don't know if that was the question. There is a research being done, but there is really nothing AI related into CRT yet. Uh, Patrick Stigma, he has a paper on basically using AI for doing the absorption lookup tables, but that's, uh, uh, I know Mark Liu is working on basically using AI for doing radiative transfer calculations. Uh, there are uh, people at NASA using AI for doing uh, all the sky calculations. So those are the parts that I know you can like the lookup tables, uh, and also doing the, instead of using the scattering solvers that we have, you can use AI. Yeah, thanks for the question. <laughs>